Um, the last call is from Robert, pronouns he, him, in Georgia. Um, wants to talk about the empty tomb. Robert, you're on Atheist Experience. How are you doing? Howdy. How's y'all's days going? Really good. Thank you for waiting over two hours to ask us this question. It's very kind of you. Yeah, no, um, I'm loving the vibes. Uh, y'all are just awesome. Um, a lot of positive energy. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't know if, if y'all, like, if, if anything was written down about this, but um, I, I'm kind of in between, like, a theist and an atheist perspective right now. A little backstory. Up until I was about 15, um, I was Christian, raised in, you know, relatively conservative Christian household in rural Georgia, blah, blah, blah. About mm -hmm. the time I turned 15 or 16, I started watching the atheist experience a lot, actually. And this was, uh, this was back when I, I think Matt Dillahunty was on here a lot, um, like every week or so. And uh, that actually started my deconversion process into atheism. And mm -hmm. for the last four or five years, you know, I've been pretty staunch agnostic atheist, haven't really questioned that. Um, but recently I got into a debate with one of my friends who used to be an atheist back in high school, but has now turned into a Catholic. And we started talking about some narratives in the Bible, you know, the prophecies in Daniel, which we know Daniel was written in like 164 BC because, you know, prophecies are accurate before then. And then they're just, you know, shit afterwards. <laughs> so, um, but we, we got to talking about the empty tomb narrative. And I started doing some research into oral history, oral tradition, and things of that nature because um, I remember watching uh, one of, uh, correct me if I pronounce his name wrong, but Bart Ehrman, or Bart Ehrman, um, I remember watching one of his lectures and he was talking about how oral tradition is, you know, it's unreliable. The, the first Gospels that we have, um, or, or rather whenever we think the Gospels were written was between, you know, 70 to 100 AD, about you know, four decades after Jesus died. Um, hmm. The earliest thing that we think was even written um, in terms of Christianity was, you know, I think the letter to Thessalonians, which was like 20 years after Jesus died. Um, but I guess, like, my question is, like, what are y'all's thoughts on the empty tomb narrative? Like, how likely is it that, you know, you think the empty tomb was fundamental to, like, early Christianity? And, um, you know, even, even if so, I know that doesn't necessarily prove that there's God, but it, it's something that's just kind of been bothering me, because the more I think about it, the more I'm like, I just don't see why you know, any of these, these people would be um, encouraged to, to really um, to lie about something like this, you know, given the fact that, you know, Christianity was a, a very small religion, like it was very likely that they were to be persecuted and or um, killed for their beliefs. So I, I just wanted to get y'all's opinions on this. Seth, take us home. Well, you know, I struggle a little bit with why do we think anybody would lie about it? What would be their motivation? And, you know, I, I think what would be the motivation? Did I understand you correctly, Robert, when I, when I heard that? Yeah, yeah, you, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think why would someone be motivated to write down the myth of Perseus? You know, why would someone be motivated to write down the myth of, of uh, Muhammad? And the, you know the the winged uh, horse that flew up into the heavens. You know, I mean, we can we can speculate about motivation, but I think the larger question is: Is there any real reason to believe it? And I think that conversation starts with an examination of the Gospels. And if you want to start with the empty tomb story, that's terrific, because the Gospels actually disagree in all of the books about. The logistics of that story. In fact, if you read them, not in a linear way, but if you read the empty tomb story side by side, you will find that they are written mm -hmm. absolutely differently. They contradict, they actually negate each other. There was Mary, or there was Salome, or there was Mary Magdalene, and then there was three, and later there's totally conflicting accounts because the Bible, the Gospels don't even agree with each other. So beyond the idea that we're going to accept a supernatural uh, resurrection by a deity that died for our sins, all of these claims requiring meeting of burden of proof, we have to say if the Bible can't even agree on the logistics, the specifics, the characters of the story itself, how reliable would the Bible be? So I don't think the question is who would ever make this up. I think, does it make sense? Is there any evidence for it? And if the Bible is absolutely inerrant and God's perfect truth, why doesn't the Bible agree with itself on this one story, let alone all of the others? That's my two cents. I see. Yeah, I've been kind of debating with myself about this, too, for the same reasons. Because, like, you know, in Mark, it's, it's a very simple account. It's, 
you know, he's, he's buried in the tomb. Um, and I could be wrong on this, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, two, two women come by, they see that it's empty and they run away. And then, you know, yeah. Mark 16, nine through 20 is just a later edition. It's, it's not actually in the original manuscripts, but you know, it starts to get slightly more embellished and more embellished as time goes on. And that's something where, you know, to myself, I've been like, this is evidence that this is, you know, this is clearly a legend, but at the same time, like, you know, you were talking about why would we invent, um, why would someone invent the myth of uh, Perseus? Is, is, that what you, is that who you said? I um, just brought like, up a, a mythological on. character at random. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, like, what makes them different to me, and this, again, is not necessarily evidence for God, but what makes them different to me is it would seem like there wasn't much of a threat of persecution for, for coming up with those narratives, whereas, um, you know, Christianity was not, it, it, the extent of persecution was not as severe as a lot of people, you know, think it was, but it, it was prevalent. It, it was something that happened. And well, I, doesn't some of this speak though to, to my God is bigger than your God, right? We saw the polytheistic religions and then we saw, you know, each deity became more and more powerful. And then you had the virgin birth narrative, which makes them even more supernatural. And then we began to hone it down. Well, now Yahweh can defeat all of the other gods. We look at the 10 commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me, which tells us that there were other gods apparently and Yahweh trumped them. And then we had Christianity becoming the law of the land. I mean, there's all these political dynamics at play, but I think, wow, they were really oppressed. Therefore, maybe there was something there. I understand the spirit of what you're saying, but it still doesn't mean that it was authentic, truthful, or that it really makes any logistical or even moral sense. Okay, I understand. Um, I, I guess the, the other question I had about, and it, it relates to the, the MP2 narrative, but... Um, you know, the resurrection narrative, I, I believe, it, 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 there's differing accounts. I know Paul says there's like, you know, 500 and something people who saw Jesus, and some of them are alive and some are dead. It's mentioned nowhere else in the Gospels. Um, but there seems to be some consistency around the fact that um, the, the 12 disciples, they they all at least have claimed to have seen um, a risen appearance of Jesus. And I'm aware that uh, post-bereavement hallucinations, I, I think is the term for it, they're a thing. Um, it, it, you know, people when someone that they love or a leader that they love when they die, they have this tendency to, to see hallucinations or have these very lifelike events um, after they die. And they, they think that they actually see them. And the rates of this happening are like, you know, 30 to 60% from what I could find. And for 12 people or, or more, I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure on the biblical accounts of exactly how many people saw Jesus post death and, or, you know, theoretical resurrection, but, um, the chances of that are, you know, like one in a million to 10 million, if I did the calculation correct, if the odds of that are like 30%. Um, so it, I guess like what my question is like, is, is there a valid reason to assume that not necessarily is this not true, but do, do we think that they're lying about whether or not they saw God or they, they saw Jesus post-resurrection? Do we okay, think that right. that is accurate? Right. I have to jump in one more time, um, mostly because I know Forrest is going to probably be, be on the air till this time next week, and I want to jump in with my final thought. We have a show tomorrow. I have to do that um, instead. Um, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, I think it's Mark has two, possibly three authors, none of whom we really can verify who they were. The earliest gospel, I think, written in 79, CE. This was long decades after the alleged death, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So these were not eyewitness accounts. This is, if, even if it was reporting, which we do not know that it was, it would have been someone told someone told someone or whatever. We, we haven't even nailed those down. And so, uh, you know, eyewitnesses, that's a problematic word. We have no reason to believe there were eyewitnesses. And you know, even Bible scholars go through and reverse engineer the Gospels, and they see a litany of problems with the account. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we have the realization that Christ was not the first dying and rising God. He wasn't the first God that atoned for sins so that others could receive salvation. He wasn't even the first God who was crucified. I think it was the God in Nana that was crucified and rose again. And uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I don't think we can start with, wow, we, a lot of people saw it and the odds of them agreeing or the odds of it being a lie seem shaky. I think the first part of the sentence becomes the problem. 
a lot of people saw it as sim simply something we can't verify. Yeah, I also want to point out that, like, you know, the, the, you talk about the resurrection story as if it's one story. And like, yeah, people professed it and believed it if it was true, but it's also not one story. Um, I just went and just Googled it just real quick and pulled it because I didn't want to dig through my Bible out to find it because I've got my <laughs> notes are all over the margins and everything. But um, who saw it? You know, who who came to the tomb? Matthew says two women, Mag Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. Mark says it was actually three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of G uh, James and Salome. Um, Luke says that it was three women, but it's a different list. It's Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. John says it was only Mary Magdalene. Mark says that the sun had already risen when the, uh, they visited. John says that it was still dark. Matthew says that an angel came and rolled the stone away and then sat on it. Mark says that when the women got there, the stone was already moved and there was a young man sitting to the right of the stone. They saw two men by the stone who then suddenly stood before them in dazzling clothing. John says that Mary Magdalene just went there and saw the stone had already been moved and didn't see any people at all. There was nothing else. Um, then there's, you know, the, 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 let's see, which disciples went to the tomb? Peter went by himself in Luke. Peter and John went together in John. The In Matthew, the uh, two disciples, Peter and John believed the reports of the women who went. They didn't go. Um, uh, they disbelieved the reports of the women in Mark and Luke. They didn't believe what the women said. And it says, it says that Matthew did. So, like, there's there's a million stories here about what happened. Depends this is what happens when you ask atheist activists about the Bible. <laughs> right? We this read the, the damn shit thing. that goes down <laughs> when you ask an atheist about the Bible, Robert. I blame you for getting him started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, the, the, reason, the reason I ask about this is like, I'm, I'm not convinced that the Bible is 100% accurate by any stretch of the imagination. I, even if I were a Christian, like it's just, it's, it's not debatable. There are issues with it. Um, as, as you know, time has progressed, my, my parents have kind of become, you know, more like liberal Christians. And uh, I actually had a conversation with my mother today about this. And, you know, she was talking about how I think it's a very, very personal thing. You know, the only consistency that I really see between the gospels is Jesus died, was raised, you know, through faith, we, we, we reach salvation. She doesn't even believe in stuff like you know, gay marriage being wrong or, or things of that nature. So I just wanted to ask, because like, I, I, I kind of felt like maybe there was some merit to the idea that this narrative has kind of always existed and was very likely to be what the um, young Christians had experienced, you know, when, when Christianity was right at its foundation. And maybe that led some, lends, lended some credence to the idea that it was um, a legitimate resurrection, but I understand that has like shaky ground. I'm, I'm not well, definitely not. Is, trying there's to also the history, issue of you know, as I you, as you I do. get ready to sign off. Let me I let me I'm I'm feel compelled to leave you with these words. First of all, you started by saying you you might be an agnostic. You're not really sure. I don't really care what you call yourself. What's important, Robert, is that you are on your journey, and that you are prepared to look at this stuff and ask yourself, does it make sense? And I believe you're honest enough if it doesn't make sense to say that, right? This isn't working. I know this contradicts itself. I'm curious about it. I want to dig deeper. I think that's an amazing place to be. So you can call yourself whatever. I don't give a shit. What I do care about <laughs> is the fact that you are living your life on your terms. You are curious and you are interested in whether something is true or whether it's not. And wherever that journey takes you, I wish you the very, very best. I think, though, as you look at the Bible and Christianity, there are a couple of things that I think you might take with you. The first is to, underst to, to understand how contradictory and problematic Scripture is, and there is a ton of resources on this. I think you'll start to see one domino click into the other domino, and before you know it, it's, you're, gonna see, you're not going to be able to hear over the noise of the whole thing crashing down. And uh, uh, secondly, watch how people like your mother have hand-fashioned uh, religion, a type of Christianity that removes, starting to remove all the awful stuff because they're more moral than many of those verses in the Bible. That speaks to their innate goodness and good for them. I'd rather a more moderate, progressive, liberal, humanistic Christian than a dogmatic, bigoted, fundamentalist Christian any day. That's a step. Absolutely. That means she's on a journey. And I think life's about the journey, okay? All right, I think well, that's perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate those words. Um, love thank of the you, vibes. Keep up the great work. And uh, thank you.